So tonight we are, st- we're in the home stretch now of our Family Matters class. So which week 12 uh, of our time together, which is crazy. We've been at it this long. Our journey through looking at marriage, what God's word has to say about marriage, some really practical application of how to develop good communication skills, how to deal with conflict, forgiveness, all those kinds of things. At the very beginning, we laid a foundation that tonight we're really going to pick up on as we journey through our look at what it means to be a parent. Uh, who are these kids that God has given us to raise? What is it he's called us to do? But our foundation that we laid at the very beginning of the spring semester when we got together in January was that the gospel of Jesus Christ speaks to all matters of life. Amen. Uh, everything that we need to understand and know uh, that will help us have healthy marriages and to be good parents and, and to raise kids that know and love God, right? the gospel informs all of that. Uh, and so that was kind of where we started. That was kind of the bold statement we made. And then we've just been off to the races. And so now we're going to pick up with parenting. Uh, and um, so we've got some cool stuff planned over the next few weeks. Tonight is going to be probably a really quick, really fast, lot of content that you won't be able to process it all tonight. So take good notes because I would love for this to be a conversation uh, that you have at home. You go back and you look through these things. You talk about some of these application uh, and implications of some of these things. So I hope you'll do that. So uh, take take good notes. Also, if you like to read, uh, and even if you don't like to read, uh, I think this is a book you should read. Some of what we're talking about tonight comes from this book, and, and it's, some of it's pieced together for some other resources as well. Um, but this is a book by an author, Paul David Tripp. Um, he's one of my favorite, uh, more modern authors right now, uh, theologically so rich uh, in his understanding and being able to communicate the gospel. Uh, everything I've read so far that he's written has just been so spot on. This is probably the best, well, not probably, it is, I can say that. This is the best book I've ever read on parenting um, and what it means to parent, what God's called us to do. So, uh, I'm going to have this up front here. So before you leave tonight, if you want to come snap a picture of the cover of this book, I would recommend getting one and reading it, uh, and reading it and reading it again. It is, it has been so helpful for me. Um, and there's just a lot of good stuff. So it's going to be up here. So just wanted to it is, uh, it is called Parenting. Um, Parenting, so, Paul David Tripp. Yeah, it's 14 gospel principles that can radically change your family is the subtitle, but, um, but Parenting. So as we jump in, let's open in prayer. And Pastor, would you I would be happy do to. the honor? Let's pray, guys. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening and a chance um, to pause and to think about this incredible honor and privilege that you've given us um, to, uh, to rear children. Uh, Father, it is a task that uh, can be daunting, um, especially as we look at on the horizon at our culture and the confusion that exists. Uh, Father, your word has, has given us uh, principles and a guide um, and, and we trust you, we trust the gospel um, to allow us to, uh, to pour into our families and, and to rear our children. Uh, Father, we pray that the discussion that we would have this evening uh, would be so important and so telling um, about uh, certain pitfalls and certain lies of the enemy. Um, and, and Father, we just pray for wisdom that comes from you. Uh, May it come uh, in our discussion and around the tables as we take uh, good notes and as we think well. Uh, And so, Father, your word has promised us wisdom if we would ask, and so we are asking right now. Father, through your spirit, would you give us wisdom as we think about parenting tonight? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, so who has asked this question before? Uh, whether you've been a parent for a few months, few years, or a long time, just like, like, 
who am I? Like, what in the world does it mean to be a parent? Anybody ever thought that? Even if you've not said it out loud, like, what am I doing? Anybody ever, ever, ever do that? Be honest, right? Anybody? All right, my hand's up. It's not just to get you to raise yours. Mine's up because I've said those things uh, at times. So that's what I want us to talk about tonight. Like, who are we? What has God called us to be with this title, with this responsibility and calling as parents? And I would even say, uh, we've got some grandparents in the room, I would say. So this could even say, hey, as grandparents, how do you help your kids uh, understand their role as parents? How do you support them? How do you encourage them in this role as well? So I think there's application for all of us here. But I want to start by saying there's really two basic ways we can look at this role and who we are as parents. So you see on your, your notes there, the first one is kind of taking an ownership view of parenting. And here would be some of the things we would say if this is kind of our view of parenting. These children belong to me, so I can parent them in the way that I see fit. Ownership for parenting is motivated and shaped by what parents want for their kids and from their children. And ownership parenting, it's kind of a subtle shift in thinking and motivation that puts the trajectory, this is why it's dangerous, it puts it in a way that leads away from God's design. But thinking for a minute as you look at some of those statements right there, um, as I look at some of those statements right there, I would say there have been times I have been guilty of adopting at least some of this or the spirit of some of this at times. Anybody else? Nod a head, raise a hand, like, yeah, like. Uh, yeah, there's that classic uh, Cosby line where, where he said, uh, I brought you into this world and I can take you out. Yes. My mother used that. that laughs uh, and chuckles. Get, that got used. That got times used times in my house. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And I've thought it a lot of times. <laughs> well, for us, uh, getting children, like, whoops, it's not something we planned. <laughs> Yeah. Like, uh, like, oh, here we go. <laughs> here we go. Let's do this. All my yeah. dad had to do was look at you a certain way. You do it. You are already. <laughs> right. But in some ways you say, well, what's wrong with some of these statements, right? I mean, my parenting is motivated what I want for my kids. And, and in some ways there are things I should demand from my children if I'm going to raise them to be who they're supposed to be. So some of that doesn't sound so off in our, in our thinking. And if they don't, if these children don't belong to me, right, then I'm who is supposed them. to raise them? What? And who do they belong? Yeah, who do they go to, right? Um, but there's, there are some words matter, and there are some subtle, like the last statement says, there's some subtle shifts here that I think there is a better way to look at this role that we have as parents than an ownership view. And here's why. There's a couple of scriptures that immediately pop to mind about why I would say that. Galatians 2.20 says that we have been crucified with Christ and we no longer live, but who is it that lives through us? It's Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God. So we aren't even our own anymore. Uh, and so that's, that, that is clarifying for us to understand that even the life we live as followers of Jesus, right? We're not living it on our terms. We're living it on, on his terms. It is his life lived through us. And then the psalmist says that children are a heritage from whom? From the Lord, the fruit of the womb, a reward. So scripture even points to when God blesses us with children, right? They are, they are from him. They, they belong to him. He has blessed us with them. So the view that I want us to kind of look at this evening and talk about what are some values that help us to adopt this view is one that says we are an ambassador of God in the lives of our kids. And so what would that look like? What would be some statements? Here are some that you see on the screen that really help to clarify what we mean when we say we're kind of taking on an ambassador view when it comes to our parenting. It begins with the recognition that your children don't belong to you. Who do they belong to? 
the Lord. They belong to the Lord. They're, they're, they're the Lord's. God's plan for parents with this view is that you would be ambassadors in the lives of the children that have been formed in his image. And here's a great word, have been entrusted to your care. Subtle, but really important shift in thinking. They don't belong to me. I don't own them, right? But I have been entrusted by God with a job as his ambassador in the lives of my children for a purpose um, that is that we're gonna get into as we, as we talk tonight. And then the last one, right? When we think of parenting this way, we start to understand that it can't be shaped or directed by our personal interests or a need that we have or even culture. Culture doesn't get the right to define what it means to be a parent and how we parent the children God has blessed us with when we adopt this view, because we recognize, I mean, what is an ambassador? One who speaks on behalf of, of the king, right? Of, of the one who has sent him, right? And so to understand that, that idea that God has given us an authority in our kids' lives to raise them to bring them up to know the Lord. That's what we're gonna look at tonight. But ultimately they belong to him, but they've been entrusted to us. So how are we doing with that, um, with that trust? A couple more statements here. Yeah, I was just, it, Go ahead. this is really gonna play out on the next pages as it unfolds, uh, because that statement of, of what we just said in terms of, if you take this ambassador view, it means your, your own interest, your own needs, and even the culture's perspectives uh, do not define the task. And just made me think real quickly of an example. Uh, I don't know if you ever read in Andre Agassi's uh, uh, biography, he got to the end of his career as one of the greatest tennis players ever and said he absolutely hate, hates tennis, hates tennis. The only reason he played was, was for his dad's approval. Um, and, and he actually is more happy now that he's finally done with tennis because he hated it. And then, and then you just think about how, how parents live their lives through their kids and, and see it as this, like, well, I own you and, and you are fulfilling a need in me. Um, and it, it gets real warped real quick. Yeah, it, it definitely can. And that's why we started so many weeks ago by saying the gospel has to clarify what it is we do. Our identity is rooted in that, but it's, and if it's not rooted there, it can very easily get rooted in our kids. And we're gonna see that as this plays out. And that's kind of what this statement here is talking to, both an ambassador view of parenting. Parenting is not first about what you want for your children or from your children, but it's about what God in grace has planned to do through you in your children. Now that is a, that is a sobering statement, but what a, what a powerful and an exciting statement to know that each and every day, even on the days that seem overwhelming, like when is the laundry ever going to end? Do I have to feed them again today? Uh, like, you know, I've cleaned the house 20 times, really, we've got to do it again, right? Even in those moments to be able to stop and, and pull back and, and get this perspective that God in his grace planned to use you to do something in the life of these, these little ones. Uh, what, a, what an awesome thought. What an awesome responsibility, but what an awesome thought that, that God has placed them in your care. He's entrusted you with the most incredible job that any of us could ever have as moms and dads. And so that's what an ambassador view of parenting latches onto that and, and, and tries to keep that on the forefront, in the forefront of their mind. And, but here's what we need to acknowledge, is that it is a daily battle fought in our own hearts to land in this place and not to land in the one that says, you know, no, it's, it's more about, about me um, and, and taking that ownership view. That this is going to be, it's not something we're gonna learn and, and then we've got it and we're never gonna struggle. We're not gonna drift toward the other one. This is gonna be a daily thing that God is gonna to have to do that we're gonna to to rely on him to do in us uh, and to, to do through us. So kind of set it up where we're going, but what I want us to spend the rest of our time on is, is what's uh, on the next several pages here. Uh, you've got something on the back of page one. This is something just for you to do on your own where you look at um, 
how you define identity, work, success, and reputation, uh, and what it would look like if you define those things with more of an ownership view or more of an ambassador view. So you've got some scriptures to guide you there, but it's just a place for you to kind of just process maybe some ways that how you have maybe had more of a view, that view that maybe isn't quite as healthy and moving toward one that is much more biblically in line with what God's called us to do. So that's just something for you to do uh, on your own. But where we're going is this idea, these five values of uh, ambassador parenting here. So we're gonna talk about these, some we're gonna spend more time on, uh, which this first one will be one of those because this is the one that kind of just uh, sets the rest of them in motion. If this one isn't foundational, the rest uh, could easily fall apart. So this first one, first value, fight for the heart. And here's what we mean by that. Beware of winning the fight for right behavior and losing the heart in the process. You know what we mean by that, right? As parents, it could be very easy to only discipline the behavior, get the right behavior, get the right behavior, and never address the heart that's behind it. Yeah, it's exactly right. Um, and so how do, we, how do we do it? How do we adopt a fighting for the heart mentality as we parent our, our children? Well, two, two ways that I think are, are, we could talk about several, but these two I think are, are critical to communicate in a way that shows value for the relationship, right? As we, now, is it wrong to correct bad behavior? As parents who are ambassadors in the lives of our kids entrusted with this responsibility, should we correct bad behavior? Okay, that's good. I'm glad we all are, we're all in alignment there. That's, we'd have to pause if we weren't. Is it wrong to not correct bad behavior? Yeah. Oh, very good. Trick question and you got it right. Good job. So, all right. But is there, but in correcting that behavior, is there a way to remind our children that, that shows value for the relationship that we have with them as we do that? as we correct behavior. Is that, think about how God disciplines us. That's a great perspective as we think through this, right? Does God discipline us as his children? You ever, ever realized I am, the Lord is disciplining me right now. Anybody ever been there? Yeah, is it, is it painful at times? Uncomfortable at times, right? But do we know that he loves us? that he's patient with us. His word tells us he is patient with us. Uh, he is compassionate. Uh, he, he shows mercy. Uh, his discipline is never as severe as it, need, as it probably we deserve for it to be, right? He is a good father, uh, not to steal uh, the song uh, title there, but, but this idea that it values the relationship, uh, that's part of what it means fighting for the heart and also connecting our discipline, connecting when we're helping our children, when we're guiding them, we're raising them, connecting what we do as parents in raising our children to the bigger story. What do you think we mean by that when we say the bigger story? A big picture. A big picture? Maybe the, the underlying truth behind the correct behavior, something like that. Okay. Scripture. Lining it up with scripture. Lining it up with scripture. Life correct. Okay, connecting it to just bigger, bigger print, bigger truths, okay. Ultimately bigger relationship that they will have with God. Yeah, there we go. Eternal perspective. Yes, yes. Uh, ultimately, like everything that we do in fighting for the hearts of our kids is recognizing that, you know, we are helping them understand an eternal perspective, their relationship with God, that what we do is, is teaching them, it, it's helping them, it's guiding them, it's shaping them to make it possible for them to understand what it means to have a relationship with, with their heavenly father. Uh, with their creator, right? 
So that, yes, that is that idea. It's, it's, it's with this eternal perspective, right? And so, yes, it involves a lot of the things that, that you guys were, were saying there, but connecting what we do, why is it important to do that? To connect it to that bigger purpose when we think about sometimes this fight of, for our kids' hearts to help them, to shape them and guide them. Because they're going to be influenced by the culture they're in now. There's mm-hmm. been a lot of talk, I think, from our pastor about this culture that's missing. <laughs> yeah. I think that's a great truth and something that needs to be God's history. Okay. Yeah, there's a, there, there is a, there is an, there are influences out there that are wanting to paint them a different story. Um, absolutely. What else? I think it goes back to page one. You know, if we're correcting them, we're teaching them, not because we own them, but because we're ambassadors. So at the end of the day, the source of our authority isn't because we can procreate, it's because God has entrusted someone to us. And we have to keep that in proper check. Okay. Yeah, so if you couldn't hear, he, he just said, if you tie that back to, to page one, right? That we are, we are ambassadors for Christ. And ultimately, right, uh, to see everything through the lens of the gospel. So the, the Gospels uh, reminds you that uh, the heart always gravitates towards uh, law, right? Towards law. And it's so easy to just get stuck in law. So if you are correcting your children and only giving them law, they need the law. The law is the tutor. But if you never reach and get the heart and get behind it, then they stop at law and they never get to the gospel. So the gospel always reaches into the heart and begins to pull that relationship forward. Yeah, that's really good. So these, um, this next slide here with these, and so why is it so important to fight for the heart? This will give some clarity to what we're even talking about when we say this. Why is this an important thing that we are called to do? Because there are some things that are true about our kids. And guess what? They're true about us as well. Any of these things we talk about that are true of our kids, you know, they're, they're also true right here. So these three things, right? Why would we fight for the heart? Because our kids are lost spiritually without a relationship with Jesus Christ, right? That they are lost as parents. We're not just dealing with bad behavior but a condition that causes bad behavior. So when you tell your kids to pick up their toys in their room and they don't do it, right? Keeping it in perspective to understand, right? It's not just about the toys, right? But there's actually a, con- there's a heart condition, right? It may seem very insignificant at three years old that they didn't pick up or something like that. But to understand, no, but there is a bigger story. There's something bigger going on, right? My child, it's not just bad behavior, but there is a heart condition that causes that behavior that God has called me to put a spotlight on and to help my kids learn how to recognize that in their lives. Another one, foolishness. Right? And sometimes this makes this, this, this steps on parents' toes when I've shared this one before. Parents are like, how dare you say that about my precious, my precious little one? So just pick your feet up if you don't want your toes stepped on. All right. The foolishness inside your children is more dangerous to them than the temptations outside of them. That is a potent statement, especially considering uh, our current culture because our culture wants to say your kids are these innocent little angels they're born innocent and if if you want to dive down into the psychology of where our culture is our culture has believed uh you guys heard of bf skinner and and So psychologist from early uh, 1900s, his theory is that um, man is basically neutral and that the environment shapes everything. And if you just get the right environment, then you won't have any problems, right? Um, It's 
because of Darwin and, and the cultures bought into Darwinism, then the only thing that there is to shape is, is outside environmental issues. Well, when you hear our culture speak, that's all they ever blame. There's, there's no responsibility, and there certainly isn't what Scripture would say, foolishness bound up in the hearts of all of us, and evil. We don't talk like that. We always blame circumstances. But if you're going to be a good parent, a biblical parent. Yeah, you've got, you've got to recognize it, right, that you're parenting a sinner. Uh, <laughs> You, a sinner parented you when you were, you know, you're a sinner, right? <laughs> sinners parenting sinners. Like to, to recognize that, right? It's, it's sobering, but there's a freedom in that to know, right? That it's not when your child continues to wrestle with sin, right? And to wrestle with authority and obedience and all the things that we wrestle with with our kids at, 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 as they grow up, right? And we may think, what have I done wrong, right? What, what's wrong with me? Am I a failure as a parent? No, you're parenting a sinner, right? And we're going to see kind of what, how we should view that. But this idea that God has said, you know, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God, right? Until our kids, you know, understand the gospel and make a decision to place their faith in Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit transforms their life to understand, hey, and even after that, right, they're still wrestling with that old sinful nature. So this idea... Um, that it's not just about protecting them from outside influences, that's important, but that is not the only job we have. They're bi the biggest threat to our children and their relationship to God is actually within them. It's not outside of them. That actually will change the trajectory of your parenting when you, when you understand that and apply that uh, to, to what you do each and every day. And so the last one here ties into these two um, false gods. You are parenting a worshiper. And it's important to remember that what rules your child, your children's hearts will control their behavior. Right? We could see that at every age, but I would say, hey, if you're parenting a teenager, uh, if you're in the room parenting a teenager, this would be, you know, this becomes very apparent the older our kids, the older our kids get. Uh, like see, uh, if, you, if you see issues in their behavior, let's look back at uh, well, what's, what's, what's on the throne of their life. Uh, you know, what is, has what is taken that place of, of God in their life that needs to be corrected, right? So that gets us to the heart of the issue, right? What is the pattern we see with Jesus in his teaching in the gospel? Was he concerned with just the outward sins and, and expressions of it? What did he always get to when he taught? The heart. All right, yeah, he got to the heart of the issue. Why, you know, yeah, you were doing something wrong, but let's get to the actual heart of, of why you were doing that, right? That's, that's one of those things we've been called to do in the lives of our kids. So anything else on this one before we... Yeah, I wanted to give just a super practical example, just so we can see how this has played out in real life. So let me give you, uh, let me give you a scenario, and then I want you to tell me um, uh, if, if this was done uh, according to the heart. So let's say you are um, uh, walking in the grocery store, and you've got a, a three-year-old who decides that... Uh, uh, he really wants some Lucky Charms, and you say, no, we're not getting any more Lucky Charms. And then he falls down on the uh, floor and begins kicking and screaming. Uh, you, you yank him up by the arm, um, and then you tell him, you are embarrassing me. Get up. Let's get out of here. Get to the car. All right, the end of that situation's over. You're in the car, and then you, again... You have embarrassed me for the last time. You know what? We are not going back to the store like this anymore. You're just going to have to stay at home from now on because I can't take you to the store. You're absolutely embarrassing me, and I look like an absolute fool around the uh, grocery store. I can't take you anywhere. All right, good or bad parenting? All right, why? All right, let's work through it real quick. All right, so Josh said what? It's me-based. It's me-based, right? So you think about the ownership at the beginning? Everything I pointed to was you're embarrassing me. I own you, 
and you've now made me look bad, okay? At, at any point, did we deal with heart issues or the Lord? No. What would it look like to begin to expose heart issues? What is the heart issue going on in the child? Okay, all right. He's, he's, he's selfish, he's disappointed, those sorts of things, all right? So at whatever age is appropriate, and then for you as a parent, one, to be calm, all right? You can deal with the situation in the moment and say, get up, this is not how we behave. But then, then when, maybe when you get back to the car, then you can sit down and go, all right, we're going to deal with some heart issues now. Let us discern the heart. It's not that you embarrassed me, okay? Let's get to your heart. If, I, if all I ever said was you embarrassed me, um, it's, it's just punitive, it's just corrective, it's just law, right? Never dealt with their heart. It never even dealt with the relationship. It never pointed to the Lord, right? Would we all be, I mean, I gave that example because like, that's a, that's a real life issue that's occurred a hundred times in my household, right? And, and this is why it's, it's good to stop and to think on something super practical like that, that just says, look, are we really dealing with the heart? Are we really giving the gospel? Of course it's age appropriate, but, but you have to be able to point to real sin issues within the heart and then, and then show them how, how Jesus came to redeem that. So something, uh, I'll say this here, we could say it all throughout the night, but I'll just say it right here up front with this one. If, if we are going to fight for the hearts of our kids and do these things that we're talking about, our, we can't be our kids' friends, first and foremost. I hear that so many times um, over the years as a youth pastor and a family pastor, parents, and I'll watch them, like even if they didn't say the words, I'll watch the behavior, and they were always trying to be their kids' friends. Right, it's like, let me reason with you. Let me, let me just try to, you know, let's have a compromise, right? It was this, it was that kind of language, right? I want you to like me. I want us to get along and be buddies, right? Because that's what we want. You can't fight for the hearts of your kids if your first and foremost goal is to be their friend. Um, you've got to be their parent. And that is so important. And I am so thankful um, that I had a father growing up who could have cared less about being my friend as, as I grew up. He cared about being my dad uh, and making sure I understood what was right, what was wrong, how to walk with the Lord. He modeled what it meant to walk with the Lord. I'm so thankful for that. And guess what happened? When I became an adult, guess who my best friend in the world was? My dad, right? And so it, it, it can be, become that kind of relationship. But as we're fighting for the hearts of our kids, you're not always going to be liked. <laughs> and you have to almost just become okay with, with not being liked in these moments. And that's hard. That's just owning it. That's a hard situation. Um, but we spent a good bit of time on this one. It's, some, it's one to think through. This is a good one to have more conversations on. How do I do this? How do I point these situations um, to the gospel? Next one, value two, creating a rhythm. This one ties a little bit back into our topic last week where we just saw the dangers of busyness and priorities in our lives and how sometimes those weed out and keep us from doing the best things uh, because we get so stinking busy on just stuff. This one talks about hey, creating a rhythm in our home. So which what we mean by that is increasing the quantity of quality time that you spend with your children and as a family. Um, why is that important? Because the rhythm in your home actually shapes your family values. The things that you spend the most time doing are, are communicating a message to your kids about what you value, what's most important. Um, so the rhythm in your home is so important. And this one gets to this role that we have as moms and dads to disciple our kids. Right, the rhythm we're talking about is a rhythm of discipleship that starts to invest in our kids the things of the Lord and helps them understand who He is and what it means to walk with Him. That's the rhythm we're talking about. This statement right here makes people uncomfortable sometimes. 
uh, what happens in your home is more important than what happens at church. Think about that one for a minute. What happens in your home is more important than what happens at church. Too many times, right? Even well-meaning parents have said, you know, I'll make sure my kids have food and clothes and a house and that they go to school and they do their homework and they, you know, and that they're involved in some kind of extracurriculars. Like I'll, I'll, I'll make sure they're well-rounded, you know, children, right? But this role of discipling my kids, I'm going to hand that role off to the church. Um, I'm going to let them do that. Well, there is a major problem with that, and that's those numbers there at the bottom of this screen. In a year's time, average church-going family professing faith in Jesus Christ the church, the youth pastors, the children's ministers, the, the leaders, the small group leaders in the church, 40, 40 hours a year is what we would get with your kids on average to invest in them. As a parent, you know how many hours you get? Waking hours, uh, factoring out sleep and time at school, just waking hours when most likely you will be able to converse and have conversations with your kids, 3,000 hours. So where are your kids going to be discipled? Home, right? That's where the discipleship is going to happen. So there's got to be a rhythm that gets established in order for that to take place. We don't have time to go there this evening, but Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9, may be a familiar passage of Scripture to some of you. I'd encourage you to go home and read it. There is a rhythm that Moses, from direction, under direction from the Lord, gives to the people of Israel as he tells them, listen, as you go into the promised land, right, if your families are going to remember who I am and what I've done, and if you're going to walk with me as my people, there's some things you need to, be, to do. And he gives them a rhythm of how to make sure that they continue to tell the story of who God is and what it is he's done. So that rhythm pattern, we even see it in Scripture. Did you have something you wanted? I looked like you were getting ready. Okay. So I've got one for you in your book here. Um, this is just an example of what we mean by a rhythm. This is not the be-all, end-all. This is not scriptural, but this is just practical application. If Scripture says, hey, there is a rhythm to how you can continue to incorporate the things of God into the everyday conversations that you're having with your kids to establish that rhythm. So thinking about it in terms of times that you're with your kids, what should you be communicating with those times? What role should you take in those moments? And what is the goal? I think this is a helpful chart. This is just a practical tool. You may come up with a better one. But thinking through, okay, in the morning when my kids are, are getting up, we're, get, we're getting ready for school, right? What are some things I could be doing, rhythms, right? I could be encouraging them, encouraging words uh, in their life, taking on a role of a coach uh, in their life. I used to do this. I followed this one for a while uh, with, with my girls as they were getting ready for school. And even I'd incorporate the morning time and drive time. And I would kind of use those two to really just I say, hey, what do you guys got going on today? What's been going on, um, you know, in life? And even before they get out of the car, I would remind them, you know, hey, you're a follower of Jesus. God's called you to make a difference today at school, to be a light for Jesus, to stand up when you see things that are wrong, right? To, to be bold in your faith. And, and you have the ability to do that. Right. As you as you as you walk away, as you head off into school, you have that ability because of the spirit of God that dwells in you. Right. We would have those kind of conversations because I thought, man, this is a I have a captive audience with my kids here. So every morning that is what we would do. And then we would pray right before we pull up in the school drop off line. And if there was ever a morning like, you know, just full disclosure here, I'll be transparent. Like if, if my wife and I had kind of gotten into a fight that morning before I got in the car and I was just in a foul mood, right? And I didn't want to say anything and I just turned the radio on and just drive. My girls would remind me, dad, we didn't pray. Like they, they it, so it became a rhythm to them. Like this is something we do, right? Mealtime. I would encourage you, right? If you think about your week and you can't find at least, you know, 
two, three, four times a week that you are sitting down together as a family, being able to share a meal together, then you may be too busy if you can't find time to do that. Uh, because mealtime is another incredible opportunity to process the day, to think about what's happened and help your kids begin to interpret what they've seen, what they've heard, what they've experienced through the lens of God's word. And then bedtime is the other one, especially for young kids, right? Prayer time, reading God's word, reading stories from scripture, uh, singing together, uh, singing worship songs before you put your kids to bed, taking on that role. It just builds a sweetness and an intimacy with them. So this is just a a sample of a rhythm, but I would encourage you that this is an incredible value uh, that is good to establish and establish it at any age. It doesn't have to be, well, my kids are in middle school now, or my kids are already in high school, opportunities passed. I don't think it is. I, th I think you can absolutely start establishing a rhythm at whatever point you recognize the importance of it. And there are all sorts of helps for these Guys, you can use uh, a daily uh, Bible verse of the day when you're in your car. That's what me and my boys do. What's the, what's the verse of the day? They know to pull out their phone and read it to me. Uh, there are all sorts of helps around the table, depending upon the age of your children, um, that are great discussion uh, cards. They make them. Uh, I, we can help you find those resources. And so we have a stack of cards at our table. You pull one of those out, pass it around, different person reads it. Uh, they're age appropriate conversation starters. Uh, lots of helps for those things. And that's exactly what the next point on that sheet you have there is like, how does the church help you create that rhythm? Right, three, three basic ways as a resource, not a replacement for you, but a resource for you, which is what Jason was speaking about. Like even this class is a, is a resource for you to use to think through, how do I do these things, right? Um, as a partner, to know that you aren't doing it alone, especially if maybe you're young in your faith and you're like, I don't even know how to disciple my kids. I am so new to this. Well, as a church, we can partner with you. We can walk alongside you and help you, coach you in what that looks like. Difficult questions pop up. Yeah, look, feed them, feed them our way, right? That is, that is, that is the whole purpose for why we have a, a next-gen ministry, our children and youth ministry, to say, hey, we want to walk beside you. We want to help just cheer you on and encourage you, but also remind you, hey, at this age, pay attention to these things. These are big deals right now. This is a great area for you to focus in all along the way as a partner. And then the church also provides community. We call them growth groups, small groups, whatever you might want to call them. But the church is that place where you can do life with other people who are just as overwhelmed uh, and just as tired and frustrated sometimes. And, you know, and you can share those burdens and pray for one another and encourage one another. We all need those things. And so that is how primary ways why a church body is so important as we parent our kids. Um, and so that next sheet there, just so you can fill in these blanks, I'll throw this one up for you. Important reminders about rhythm. I would say these are really practical. Be flexible. Right? Even if you have a rhythm, right? If, if something, if, if life happens and you can't do it, don't let that cause a meltdown in your home that you have to go back later and apologize for blowing your top because, you know, you didn't get to do the thing that, um, that you had scheduled to do. Be flexible. Uh, make it fun. Uh, make your rhythm, make a rhythm fun for your kids. Make them want to engage in it. Um, participate in experiences that are designed for the family. What I mean by that is just look for ways to do things together as a family that can help your kids understand their relationship with the Lord, the fact that he's called them to think about others, right? going to serve somewhere together, uh, taking on a project like that as a family, that is a great experience that can be a discipleship opportunity. Um, going to church together, worshiping together. Uh, Sunday night, coming to a night of prayer. It's different than a normal Sunday morning worship service, but hey, as a family, we're going to do this together. We're going to go pray together. Like all of those things are experiences for your family. That can be part of the rhythm. And then ultimately, this should be 
um, you know, sometimes we forget this, the simplest things. Find one that actually works for your family. Right. If you if you're you know, if you have to be a you know, both parents are working outside the home. I know that that is that has, you know, in our culture, in our world, so many times that is that is a necessity at times. And your schedules may be opposite each other. Right. And it may be hard, but try to find find a rhythm that works for for you um, in, in your home. Just but find one and and commit to it and and, and make it make it a reality in, in what you do. So. Um, all right, we got a little more time. Next value here, make it personal. In other words, if you want something to be in your kids, if you wanna see it in them, it needs to be in you. Any parents of teenagers in the room? Yeah. Can a teenager see through a, um, a do as I say, not as I do, uh, quicker than anybody in the world? They absolutely can. <laughs> um, so as we are guiding them, as we're trying to point them to Jesus and help them understand how to walk with him, we've got to make sure that it's in us, that the things we are saying is, is valuable for them, that we're showing that it's valuable for us. Um, it's, sometimes it's that part of parenting that goes the most neglected because we just get so busy when it comes to, to raising our kids. And, and, and we almost carry it sometimes as a badge of honor that we neglect ourselves in order to give to our kids. Uh, but if you're neglecting your spiritual growth, then that, that's a problem, right? Because you've got nothing then to pour into your kids. Um, but some helpful things that I think are just encouraging and, and helpful here are some of these statements that you've got under this page. Hey, everything does not have to be right in you at this very moment or about you before you can start to be that positive influence in your child's life that we're talking about, right? You may have issues you're dealing with and struggling with. We always will. So if we wait until we think we've got it all figured out to begin to do some of these things, fighting for our kids' hearts, creating rhythms, all these things, if we wait till we think we're, we're there, we're never going to be there. So you don't wait for that. Here's one that when I heard this one, I didn't come up with this one, but this one when I heard it was convicting that my children already have a front row seat to watch my life and my relationship with the Lord. So what is it that they're watching? Like my kids get an everyday demonstration of what it means to walk with Jesus. And I have to ask myself that like, so what is it they, what is it they're getting? Like what is the message they're receiving about what it means to know and love God uh, by the example I'm setting? Cause they've got a front row seat to watch it. Um, so I need to be paying attention to that. And that's where, and tying that back to the one before it, like you, you don't have to have everything right, right? None of us is perfect. Um, but the older that our children get, the more of an authentic side they need to be able to see, Yeah. right? They need to be able to see the gospel worked out in our lives. And the gospel is most real and raw in, a, in our own confession, right? Hey, dad still makes lots of mistakes, guys. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I lost my temper. I'm working on that. You guys can hold me accountable. I'm sorry, I really wanna get better with that. Yeah, that's absolutely like, what are they watching? It's not that you want them to watch a perfect life because that doesn't exist, but you want them to watch someone who is authentic and genuine and humble uh, and will be quick to repent uh, and, and say they're sorry. That, that is an example of, of what it means uh, to walk with the Lord. So that, that will speak volumes. Uh, other things, when we talk about making it personal, we might have to actually think about what we need to stop doing so that we can start prioritizing our spiritual growth. Right? I, I'm not going to look around this room and I, I'll just assume, I'll make an assumption in this room that everybody in here does good things with their time. The things they do, there, there's some value to it. I'll go ahead and give you that grace uh, and just say, you guys all do good things with your day. You, every waking hour, you are feeling, filling it with good things. 
But if it's keeping you from the best things, then the good things aren't so good. Uh, and so what are the things maybe that we need to stop doing so that we can prioritize our spiritual growth? Um, you know, it may be I need to go to bed earlier, so I need to not watch binge watch that show at night after the kids are in bed because I stay up late watching TV. Then I can't get up in the morning early enough to have 30 minutes to spend reading my Bible and, and talking to the Lord before I get my day started. Right. Just practical things. You know, what are some things that we could we could cut out of our life in order to make room for the things that we really should be doing that will help us? in all the other things that we're called to do, right? As parents, in our marriages, all those things. Um, and then the other one on this sheet is um, find a gospel-centered community of parents. Right? Accountability, encouragement, support, people who are praying for you, people who you can learn from, uh, their, their, their experiences, their, their wins and their, and their mistakes. It's one of the things I love about a multi-generational church is that there are people here that have been where I am right now and I can learn from them. And there are people who aren't quite yet where I am, but I've been where they are that I can turn around and say, hey, let me show you where I blew it and, and maybe help you not, uh, not make the mistakes that I made. Those are important. Can I raise a point here? Yes, sir. I'm going to credit my wife on a lot of this stuff. We were early in Christian education. And our pickup truck, neighborhood friends, and everybody wanted a pickup truck. Uh, but thanks to my wife, we started putting our kids in either homeschooling or Christian education. And that last one right there, you find a whole great community sure. out there that you don't really know exists until you submerge yourself yeah. with that kind of a group of people. And yeah. it's amazing the commitment that other parents have that is similar to yours when you have a lot of things in common. Yeah. yeah. yeah if you couldn't hear in the back, Mike was just giving testimony about the importance of, of the community and other parents that share the same values. Hopefully that's what we're experiencing here tonight, right? Is, is that you can look around this room. Uh, we're talking about some practical issues in terms of like, hey, that's a good idea. I'm going to steal that. I'm going to use that. Or uh, it's, it's just e even sometimes in our confession of, man, I've really messed up in that. It, it, you, you identify. I'm not alone in that. And so uh, Satan wants to isolate you. You're not alone in this. Uh, there is a community, and we need that. Amen. All right, this next page here, I'm going to be speaking Rick Hugler's language uh, with this next one right here. So get ready, Rick. Invest in your marriage. Get <laughs> Guys, if there's one thing... Um, that I would say that has broken my heart more times that honestly God used to help me uh, as a parent was watching the number of parents that I heard say, man, I haven't been on a date with my spouse since we had a kid. We've never done anything just the two of us since we've had kids. All of our energy has gone into our kids and they wore it like a badge of honor, like that made them better parents that they neglected their marriage for the sake of their kids. And they thought that was, that was almost something they were proud of. And I watched and I look at some of those families now and, and it, it's, it's heartbreaking. And it is, it, yeah, it is a scary thing because let me tell you the best thing, one of the best things you can give your kids is a healthy marriage. Your kids seeing you men love your wives well and prioritizing her is one of the best gifts you can give your kids. I've got two daughters, right? I, I made it a goal as I watched other people's mistakes and as I read God's word and as I thought through some of these helpful things, I thought, man, I want my girls to see the way a man should treat his wife because I don't ever want them to settle for anything less than what they see. Right, if I'm setting an example for them of the kind of man they should look for, then 
I, I need to prioritize my wife. And so we've done things that, you know, sometimes we were like, oh, I can't believe you did that, right? We've gone on vacations without our kids, right? Um, we're doing that this summer. We're gonna go away for a few days, just us, and I'm leaving my 16-year-old and 19-year-old at home by themselves, right? And they're like, oh, how could you? Why don't you take us with you? Because this is time for me and your mom, right? We need to prioritize our marriage, right? You guys are fine. You don't need a vacation. You're good. Um, right? But I mean, those kinds of things, investing in your marriage is some of the best gifts you can give your kids. Uh, and it's one of the ways that you make it personal. Investing in your marriage just gives you more energy and even bandwidth to be the kind of parent you should be in the life of your kids when your marriage is healthy. Right? Because when it's not, man, it, it, it sucks the life out of you. And you got nothing left to give your kids. Anyway, got to keep going. Another one. Resting in God's mercy, right? Have we, yes, ma'am. You got to make it fast. We've got five minutes. You don't have five minutes. We have five minutes. <laughs> yes, amen. Absolutely. That is good. Yeah, it's not. It can be a cheap date. Just make it a date. Yeah, just. <laughs> That's right. That's right. I love it. That's right. Amen. That is a great point. Yes. It and is all not, the men uh, said, amen. It's not the price tag of the time. It's just committing to that time together. Very good. Resting in God's mercy uh, is so impor important, recognizing that hey, we're not always going to get it right, right? But there is mercy and there is grace uh, <laughs> to help us in those times of need. And then finally, how do we grow spiritually? I didn't even make you fill in any, fill in any blanks on these. They're right there for you. Find a plan to be able to read God's Word, memorize Scripture, keep a journal of uh, things you're praying for, learn how to articulate, articulate your faith. In other words, spiritual conversations. Weave that into the everyday fabric of talking to your kids, right? You talk about sports, you talk about school, you talk about all these different things. Make it just as natural to talk about your faith uh, and just showing them what it means to worship God with your life. All right. Last couple here, widening the circle, inviting others to invest in your children. In other words, you don't have to do it alone, and God doesn't call you to do it alone. Um, but what does he call us to do as parents? To, one of the things we could do is pursue strategic relationships for your sons and daughters. Right, to make that shift of right, moving from a me mentality to a we mentality. Um, as a youth pastor, I know you, you had experience with this too. As our kids get older, middle school, high school age, they begin to, this, this independence begins, spirit of independence rises in them. And as these little beautiful, you know, three-year-olds, right? You are the center of their world, right? They, they can't wait to see you. They come running to you, into your arms, right? And then all of a sudden you get this middle schooler and they want you to drop them off for school a block away from school because they don't want to be seen with you anymore. And you're like, what did I do? Like your heart gets ripped out of your chest, right? And, and it's just, it's brutal. And it's I'm just, I'll go ahead and tell you, it's coming, right? Those days are coming. And then you get the roller coaster of, oh, they want me close. Well, now they want to push me away. They're learning how to, they're learning independence. They're learning, they're growing up. It is a natural thing, but here's the deal. If we don't begin to widen the circle of who is speaking into the lives of our kids, helping us say the things we want said to them about their walk with the Lord and, and what it means to follow Jesus. If we're not enlisting other voices to say those same things that we want to say, those moments where they turn down our voice in their life, um, you know, it's, it's going to happen. Mark my words, those moments will happen. If we haven't enlisted other people, right, then we've created a, a void there in their lives where there's no one saying the things that we want them to know, right? There are people speaking into their lives, but it may not be saying what we would want said, right? And so that's why having, as for teenagers, having small group leaders that are involved in your kids' lives, right? You get to, right? They're not out there doing their own thing. You say, oh, no, no, no. If you're my kid's small group leader, you have become my best friend, 
right? And we're going to go to coffee or we're going to go grab lunch because I want to tell you the things that I need you to be looking for that my kids are dealing with. And I want you to be able to encourage them and say sometimes the things that maybe they're not listening to me say. That's what we mean by this principle. That's what we mean by widening the circle, right? God's, in, God's tasked you with the responsibility, right? But it doesn't mean you can't enlist people around you to encourage you in that, in that task. That's good. That makes sense? All right. Why is it necessary to widen the circle? Just so you can fill these in and you can go back and read them later, right? Uh, because there are some things that we just really aren't that good at, right? Uh, there's inability in our life that we have to own, but that's actually okay. Understanding what we can't do is sometimes the most essential thing that makes, that helps us be good parents, because then we have to rely on the Lord to do it through us, or it humbles us and it, it allows us to reach out to others who can help us in those ways. So that's an important one. Identity is another reason we need to widen the circle. And the, and the only way we can widen that circle is when we understand that our identity is not in our parenting, but it's rooted in Christ. Then that helps break down those sometimes those walls of, walls of pride uh, and, and self-sufficiency that says, I don't need anybody else to help me because if I have to ask for advice or help, then I'm a bad parent, right? But if we, and because it, it becomes an identity thing. But if we say, no, no, my identity is in Christ, right? That, that is where it's found. So I can admit that I don't have it all together. And sometimes I need wisdom and guidance and help from other people. So identity is an important part of this. And then calling, right? Understanding what it is we're called to do will cause us to say, hey, then I will do whatever it takes to make sure that I am fulfilling the call of God on my life to be one of the tools in his hands to shape my child's understanding of who God is, right? Once you understand the stakes of what we've been called to do, you say, yeah, I'll absolutely widen that circle. Uh, yeah, because we're not called to make them in our image. We're called to make them in God's image. That's really good. And so multiple voices, uh, it, it's, it's the beauty of the body of Christ. You, you need other pictures of Christ in your child's life. Amen. And then, last one, imagining the end. Focus your priorities on what matters most. To do that, you've got to be able to distinguish between what matters and what matters most. You've got to be able to discern that. You've got to be able to think that way uh, because, again, it's so easy to get caught up in the moment as a parent, especially if you've got young kids, right? It's just surviving today, right? If I can get through today, it was a win, right? If they all get to bed, right? There wasn't a trip to the ER, right? Um, somebody, somebody didn't punch somebody else, right? I didn't blow my top uh, before they all got in bed. Hallelujah, praise the Lord, it was a win. And, and it may be, that may be the win today that you needed, right? Is to say, yes, we survived this, we got there, that's okay. But there's also, to, it's good for us to remember that there is, a, there is a much bigger purpose that we are striving for and thinking about what is that end goal so that we can set our sights on what is it that God has called us to do. And so those four, those four things about why it's important to imagine the end are these four things here. To recognize, hey, parenting is a process, and we have to have a long view of parenting. It is not an overnight thing, right? We may correct a behavior today. Guess what? You're probably going to have to correct that behavior again tomorrow and next year. And then it's going to resurface in a different way as a teenager, and you're going to have to correct it then, right? If you get discouraged and say, we already dealt with that, get out of my face. That's not a long view of parenting. It's like, no, we're in this. <laughs> we're in this for the long haul. Um, Jason alluded to this one earlier, the law. Children need God's law. They need to understand absolutes, right and wrong. The holy standard that God has that we don't measure up to, they need to understand that. But you can't ask the law to do in the life of your kid what only grace can accomplish. So guess what? 
it is a journey and it is a messy journey. And there's going to be times that you have to talk. It's like, no, there's consequences for our actions. Just think about your own life. You know how short-sighted we get as parents? Like our own lives are so messy. And the, and the Lord has dealt with so much through the years. And then we're like, but what did I do wrong as a parent? Like, was it, was it our home? Was it this? Like, no, your child's sinful and it's, it's going to take some working out. It's a long process. And the same way the Lord was gracious with you and picked you up when you were and cleaned you up when you were nasty and forgave you and moved you forward. Guess what? The gospel has to do the same in your kid's life. Yeah. Uh, authority, man. This is one like I could have, I could have. If I had started here, we might never have gotten off of this one uh, about how important it is, how foundational it is for our kids to understand authority. Uh, we need to understand authority. Authority is a good thing. It's a protective thing that God has woven into the fabric of our of the of our world. Right under learning how to submit to His authority. Right. If you want to chat your children to grow up and submit to the authority of God in their lives as adults when they're no longer in your homes, that it is good and it is right for you to teach them how to submit to your authority right now. One of the things that I cringe, and if you've said this, it's not because I've heard you say it, it's nobody in this room that I've heard say this, but one of the things that just makes me go, oh, is when I see a parent trying to reason with a five-year-old, right? Um, and say, now, was that a good choice? They don't know if it was a good choice or not, right? I mean, they don't know that. So you are the authority in their life. You let them know, hey, this was not a good choice, right? And we need to talk about this not good choice and what the consequences are for this not good choice, right? They need to learn authority, right? It's not a debate about, okay, what's the compromise here, right? You don't want to do what I ask you to do, so let's come up with something that you're a little bit more okay with. Mm -mm. That's, not, that's not teaching your kids authority, right? So I'm not going to get on a soapbox there. But that's an important one, uh, that as parents, we've got to embrace. God's called us to this, and it helps get where God's called us to go. And then the last one is grace. God never calls you to a task without giving you what you need to do it. He never sends you without going with you. Um, and to understand as parents, each and every one of us are recipients of grace. Right? We stand in need of God's grace uh, every day. As parents, we're not always going to get it right. And guess what? God knows that, and that's why he, he goes with us, right? And there is forgiveness, there is grace, there is healing. Uh, there, is, there is the ability to learn from mistakes uh, and to recover from those uh, and just to continue with that long view of parenting to know God has called me to this, and so he's going to equip me to do it as I am faithful to look to him and depend upon him in the everyday stuff. So I know this was like drinking through a fire hose tonight and we're, we're out of time, but hopefully this gives you some stuff to think about, uh, talk about at home. There's even more scriptures and things here that you can use as conversations. Remember a picture of the book with your spouse? Yeah, if you, if you want a picture of the book, I'm going to lay it right up here on this table to my right, your left, right in front of us here. Um, and then next week, we're going to dig into a little bit more. We'll have a special guest with us, uh, and we're going to talk more and more about, hey, how do we do some of these things? How do we talk to our kids? How do we, how do we, how do, we do some things that really are healthy for them and help them grow to be the people God's created them to be? So I think next week will be a real treat. You'll enjoy it. God bless you. I'm going to have to let you go. All right. Have a great night, guys.